So last week we got into the life of Paul the Apostle, a little bit about his history, his upbringing, how he was a Pharisee, he was on this trajectory towards the great Sanhedrin, and you could tell he just had this great plan for his life, but God had a completely different plan. So the first mention of Saul, or Paul the Apostle, in the New Testament is centered around the life and death of a man named Stephen. And what was going on in the church at that time was the apostles were getting busy, the church was taking off, they're trying to manage everything, and they'd gotten pulled into this ministry where they're serving food for widows and people that are being neglected, and they're right in the middle of that, and they found themselves neglecting their true calling which was to preach the Word of God and pray. And that's the, that's the focus of the gospel. And of course, there's a lesson there for churches today as well. To, you can't ever get you know, away from your main call and get sidetracked by doing good things. Uh, you have to focus on your main call, which is preaching the Word of God, prayer, getting the gospel out. That's what changes people's lives. So they realized that, the church realized that, and they said, well, let's appoint seven men that can oversee the work of the ministry and then we'll give ourselves to prayer, preaching of the word, study, those, those types of things. So here's what they said, Acts chapter 6, verse 2. It says, The twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. What they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and then it goes on to name the other six as well. I want you to pay special attention tonight as we go through these passages to all the adjectives that are used to describe Stephen. Because actually, the better understanding we have of Stephen is the better understanding we're actually going to have of Paul for a couple different reasons. One is when you look at Stephen's life, he was actually on a trajectory as well. It's almost like his life paralleled Paul, in a sense, except on the opposite side. Paul was on the dark side, he's Darth Vader, Stephen's on the light side, you know, he's Luke Skywalker if you're into Star Wars. And their life was like parallel, because Stephen is an early disciple, He's, he's filled with the Holy Spirit in the upper room. He's being discipled by Peter. He clearly stands out among everyone else. Uh, we're going to continue to see some of the things about him, but you can see he was on this trajectory too. But God had a different plan for his life as well. So they kind of parallel. Another thing is, it's interesting to me how highly the Bible views Stephen. And that's why I want you to pay attention to these adjectives as we go through it. Because... God had such a high view of Stephen. And it's interesting to me that Paul couldn't see that. It's interesting to me that the Sanhedrin couldn't see that. So God loved Stephen, couldn't possibly think more highly of Stephen, and yet Paul stood by while he was stoned to death. And so if I, if I spoiled the story because you didn't know it, sorry about that, but that's what's about to happen. So verse 8, and Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. So, so far we've got Stephen, full of the Spirit, full of wisdom, full of faith in the Holy Spirit, full of grace, full of power, performing signs and wonders. This is a great man. Uh, one of the things I like about this passage of Scripture is uh, it refutes one of the common things that some people were taught growing up, that it was only the apostles that could do signs and wonders. Stephen was not an apostle. He was not one of the original 12, and yet we have him here, the Bible says, doing great signs and wonders among the people. So this guy, he's not just a busboy. He's not just over there serving tables, serving people. He's full of power, full of faith, full of wisdom, full of the Holy Spirit, and God's using him to perform signs and wonders. Verse 9, Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians, and of those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly instigated men who said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. So Stephen is then called before the Sanhedrin. He's basically put on trial for blasphemy. And right there on the spot, 
uh, they sentence him to death and they're going to stone him to death. Verse 54, now when they heard these things, they were enraged, and that being the Sanhedrin. They ground their teeth at him, but he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And so that's our first introduction to Saul in the scripture is him witnessing and giving his consent to the stoning of such a great man of God like Stephen. And the reason I wanted to read all of that about Stephen is because I wanted you to see how hard-hearted these Pharisees were, that all of their hatred towards him was misplaced. All of their, their just spewing this, you know, just evil, wicked hatred towards him was totally out of line with how God felt about him. And that was Saul. Saul was right there. And actually, it only gets worse for Saul. This is the first, this is just the first of many things to happen. Now, I want to ask you this. Has anybody in the room tonight, has anybody ever witnessed a stoning? I don't think so. But I want you to think about it for just a minute. What he's what he's witnessing here, okay? There's someone put in the center of a group. They all have rocks, large and small. They throw rocks at his head until he receives so much trauma and so much bloodshed that he literally bleeds out and dies. Uh, it's a very grotesque, dramatic way to die. And Saul gives it there. He, he, he witnesses it and he gives his approval to it. And far from traumatizing Paul, far from, from any type of conviction, there's no evidence at all that he was disturbed by this one bit. I've even heard people give sermons and say, maybe this was the first thing that gave Paul some inclination that something wasn't right. But there's no evidence from that at all. Actually, the opposite. This actually seemed to add fuel to Saul's fire because from here, he just picks it up. A whole, he shifts into a whole nother gear as far as persecution goes. And there's no evidence that this bothered him. This actually seemed to inspire him and that's the place that he was at. That's how hard his heart was at this moment. We get a picture of this in Acts chapter eight, verse two. So shortly after he just witnessed a man of God be brutally murdered, Acts chapter 2, uh, excuse me, Acts chapter 8, verse 2. It says, Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him, but Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. So this seemed to just spur Paul on. And he goes from here and just continues to persecute the church, ravage the church, ripping apart families, dragging people out of their homes and putting them in prison. And uh, he just continues that, you know, on and on until he has that great encounter with God. In Acts 26, nine, where Paul is given his testimony before King Agrippa, he's, he's uh, remembering this time period in his life. And he explains, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priest, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even into foreign cities. So we see how far his, uh, the lengths he was willing to take in order to persecute the church. It's interesting some of the things he mentions here, and we kind of got to read between the lines, but the first thing he says is that he cast his vote in putting people to death. Now, I don't know if that was Stephen because it doesn't mention that he had any authority in that situation other than he just witnessed it. But it says he cast his vote to put them to death. I punished them in the synagogues and I tried to make them blaspheme. So in other words, 
he would pull them aside. He would threaten them with prison, threaten them with death, and basically if you blaspheme the name of Jesus, if you'll revoke your faith, then we'll take all of this pain and punishment away. He was threatening with that. He tried to get them to blaspheme, um, and maybe some did, some didn't. We don't know, but that's what he was doing. That's how he was operating and how he was thinking. He was basically like a terrorist. I mean, he's threatening people with their life if they don't blaspheme the name of Jesus Christ. And this wasn't just happening in Jerusalem. He said it continued even to foreign cities. In other words, if I would hear that there was a group of Christians, a group of disciples, I would pursue them as far as I had to go to track them down. I wanted to eliminate them, annihilate them from the earth completely. And of course, we know when he was confronted by Jesus on the road to Damascus, that's exactly what he was doing. He was on his way to Damascus to track down Christians in that city. Now, I want you to think about the state that Saul was in at this moment and the condition of his heart. You know, I believe the way that sin works is that it's progressive and that the more a person participates in sin, the more hatred they entertain, the more bitterness they entertain, the harder their heart gets. And that's what we're seeing with, with Paul, is that the further he goes, the harder his heart is getting, the, the more uh, extreme things he's willing to do from killing people, murdering, putting in prison. He, there's no length he's not willing to go to. He would have appeared to the average person and to the Christians of that time he would have appeared as someone who was completely unsavable and unreachable. I mean, you would have looked at him and thought, there's no way that this man can have a turnaround. There's no way that this man could be saved and could be born again and go from this hard heart to tender and soft and loving. I mean, if there's ever been a complete transformation, it would have been in Paul the Apostle. But none of the Christians would have thought that that was possible in such a person as that even when he does have his transformation and he is saved, if you'll remember, many of the believers would not meet with him they, because they, they thought it was a trick. They thought he was pretending to be saved just to, so to gain acceptance into their group and then he was going to turn on them and capture them and murder them, put them in prison, all those things. So early on when he was first saved, some of the Christians wouldn't even meet with him because it was so unbelievable and so unthinkable that this person could actually turn to God and be born again. But really, this is a testimony to the great grace and mercy of God that someone like Paul could be reached by God. And if you look at it, he wasn't even seeking. He wasn't even seeking the Lord. He wasn't, he wasn't feeling remorseful. He wasn't going after God. He was pursuing his own agenda and his own ambitions. And yet God, in His mercy, reached down and changed His life in a moment. And I believe that that can still happen today. Next week, we're going to get into His conversion and how He came to meet Jesus Christ.